Okay, see that okay? All right. So the, the title of our, uh, this is a, a set of three sessions today, tomorrow, and the next day. Uh, and we're gonna approach things just a little bit differently in each session. Um, in this first session, um, I would like to spend some time uh, talking about strategies for understanding the patients better when they have these problems. And uh, Dr. Yellman's going to talk about a lot of interesting diagnoses that come up in our patient population tomorrow. And then we'll be talking uh, on, on Friday more, with more cases and more summaries. We uh, work at a nonprofit clinic. It's uh, called the Bateman Horn Center. And we were both employed by this nonprofit organization that has a clinic at, and a research center specifically for patients with these types of disorders. So we're going to start by talking about strategies for recognizing multisystem illnesses often presenting as widespread pain and chronic fatigue. And we've learned that if you can think of something as a multi-system illness, then it, it helps pull everything together instead of uh, ha a patient having a list of 12 or 20 different diagnoses. So I really think we all know this, but um, for a decade or more, uh, we've gotten much more in a hurry, much more financial pressures, less time with patients, and it really has created a problem uh, in that sometimes it's just too easy to treat uh, a major symptom like, like pain or fatigue with, with medications. And I think that's how, what got us into, with Band-Aid medications, and that's really what moved us toward the opioid epidemic, I think, was uh, just not having the time to sort through and really understand how to, how to uh, tease apart all the different aspects of these illnesses. I wanted to start with just a little look back uh, at a study I've never forgotten. And it's not really because it was a chronic fatigue syndrome study. Um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So in, in 1977, the Centers for Disease Control did a large population-based study to try to understand the prevalence of what they called chronic fatigue syndrome at that time. And um, it was big. It was a very big population study, cost millions of dollars. Um, they, it had three components, a screening telephone interview, a detailed telephone interview, and then they brought people in to the clinic for the third phase. And this is just to show you the study design. Um, they, they random digit dialed more than 50,000 people to do this study. Uh, then they did, they did basic screening, and then they did a very detailed uh, history uh, and telephone, med medical history on the telephone. Then everybody that they reached that had fatigue more than uh, a month uh, was, there were 3,500, 3, and then there were uh, 2,700 people who'd had unexplained fatigue for more than six months. And if anybody remembers the, uh, the old chronic fatigue syndrome criteria, you had to have been sick for six months. And then I, uh, over on the right side, uh, you can see there are these are basically, you had to have, uh, you had to have fatigue for six months, not relieved by rest, four of these eight symptoms over here, impaired memory or concentration, sore throat, tender lymph nodes, muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, unrefreshing sleep, and post-exertional malaise. And you really didn't have to have all those, you just had to have four of those. So you can imagine that it came out different uh, ways in different people. Um, so there were uh, more than a thousand people that they picked up. Um, and then those who didn't have any exclusionary diagnoses uh, were moved on in the study. And exclusionary diagnoses were medical or psychiatric diagnoses that could be giving them the symptoms. Uh, and then they uh, offered to let people come in for an examination. And there were about 300 at this point. But what st stood out to me over all these years is yes, they were able to identify a subset of all these patients that met those uh, criteria, which actually have been close to abandoned now. But I will never forget how many people um, they came in that they called CFS-like. And that was everybody who seemed to have that kind of an illness in the phone interview, but when they brought them in for one reason or another. And you can see, um, Sometimes they came up with a, a diagnosis that they felt like was exclusionary. 
that had been undiagnosed. So all those people, if they hadn't been brought in, would just be suffering and never have received a diagnosis that could have been made. And then even more people uh, didn't quite meet those symptoms, but still uh, met them when, when they talked on the phone. So these were the exclusionary medical and psychiatric illnesses. Some of them are clumped together just to give you an idea about um, how much they screened out. And anybody who had any of these diagnoses could not go on in the study. And when they did bring patients in, they, give, they did a medical history, a physical exam, psychological testing, some basic labs to look for disease. And when all was said and done, there were more than 10 times the number of people who met CFS criteria uh, had CFS-like illness. And that's the thing that's always stood out to me from this study is, and this was uh, also this, this is basically um, overall persons with a CFS-like illness versus persons who actually met chronic fatigue syndrome criteria. There were almost seven times more people that they brought in. And those are all people that did not have another obvious illness and uh, had never gotten a diagnosis. And if we projected that number, the CFS-like number, if you look over here, um, that would be 5 million people in the US right now who have unexplained chronic fatigue and aren't getting the kind of medical care that, uh, that they need in order to um, not be impaired. I mean, those chronic fatigue syndrome criteria require some degree of debilitation and uh, an altered function. So they, I've never forgotten this study um, because it made me realize uh, how, how big of a problem this is. And, and sometimes we just don't, don't realize how many people are out there. So with that in mind, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, how, we can, how we can understand and deconstruct a, a complex presentation of chronic fatigue and widespread pain. And I'd like to start out with a couple of cases. Um, these are real cases in my clinic, um, people I've seen in the last, who become a new patient to me in the last year. <clears throat> the first one is a woman who, when she presented at age, uh, to my clinic, she was 47, and um, she was experienced prof profound exhaustion, difficulty getting around her house, mostly homebound, widespread pain, mixed bad headaches, especially migraines, <clears throat> but also cognitive impairment, nausea, poor appetite, constipation, reflux, blurred vision, really sensitive to noise. Um, she had a BMI, a body mass index of 32, so a little bit overweight. Um, and at the time she came to see me, her main uh, medical provider was really a psychiatrist um, because her final di diagnosis had really been depression and, and fibromyalgia after seeing you can see all the all the consultants she saw. She saw a family practice doctor, an internist, a pulmonologist, a gastroenterologist, and, and a neurologist, and had these tests done, stress echo, polysomnography. Uh, she got endoscopy. She had an abdominal ultrasound, a brain MRI. She got a really big workup. Um, but the only diagnosis she carried when she came to my office, besides depression, uh, were uh, migraine, <coughs> a very old diagnosis of sleep apnea. I mean, they, she'd had sleep apnea for 10 years, but they did, you know, repeat her study and buff up her equipment and everything. Um, she was diagnosed with irritable bowel by the gastroenterologist. Um, she was told she had a little bit of, a little bit of asthma. Um, she's had low back pain for many years. So really the only new diagnosis was, is fibromyalgia and, and this migraine. So keep that woman in mind. I just want you to think about her um, because we're gonna come back and look at some tools uh, as we discuss her. You can maybe see how someone who's depressed and a little overweight and having these chronic problems could end up not getting very, uh, I don't know, people just gave up on her actually, her doctors and her psychiatrist was just blasting her with, with medications. So this is case number two. <coughs> kind of a polar opposite. Instead of middle age, she's younger, um, 30. Um, she has, she describes such bad fatigue, she can barely walk 
from the bed to the couch. And it's persistent after rest. She has very low energy for anything. After she does an activity, she gets worse and feels sick for days. Her arms and legs feel weak. And she feels like she's imbalanced and bumping into walls. And uh, in contrast, she's got a BMI of 18.8, which is a little bit underweight. She's very, very, very thin uh, and has had lost additional weight uh, through the course of her illness. She had widespread pain, burning, achy, morning stiffness, pain in her muscles, joints, chest pain, tension, headaches, migraines, numbness and tingling in her hands and feet, sweating, cold and heat intolerance and sound and light sensitivity. And um, it just, and she was very depressed and anxious. And by the time she came to see me, she was having suicidal thoughts because her illness was so severe. She had seen a gastroenterologist, endocrine, OBGYN. She's seen a mental health provider and uh, didn't have a primary care doctor, but um, had, had seen a number of different doctors, including being seen in urgent care. She'd had a, an ECG, an echo, many, many labs. Um, she had a, at one point a, a, mildly, uh, a mildly low TSH with, that corrected later. Um, and it's not unusual for someone her age to have low iron saturation and ferritin. Um, and her white blood cell count was just slightly down, but really her labs and everything looked completely normal. So she came to me with a diagnosis of, with these diagnoses, um, reflux and irritable bowel, headaches, anxiety. Um, she has had dysmenorrhea since she was an adolescent. And when she was in college years ago, uh, she was diagnosed as hypothyroid and she also had mono, which wouldn't be that unusual for someone her age. So keep these two women in mind and um, just think about their many, many symptoms. And how do you even begin when people have uh, so many symptoms and nothing seems to be able to explain it? So I'm just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on things that you know. One of the things I learned from uh, 10 years in my fatigue clinic is that um, most patients come to me with a pretty good workup already done by their, by their clinicians. So, you know, you screen for common causes of fatigue and widespread pain. And we'll talk about some of those basic labs on the, on the next slide. I think it's really important in this situation to take the time to do a very good review of systems and, and, and more, a longer history. And also, this is when people do need a complete physical exam. We've, we've stopped doing physical exams and that's based on the fact that it really doesn't gain, you don't really make a difference for people when you do screening physical exams year to year to year. But that's not who these people are, right? These are people who have a, a multi-system illness that's debilitating and they need someone to look them over carefully head to toe and not just parcel out little bits uh, and you know and and you know the gastroenterologist just puts tube in the in the guts and then yeah so and we we tend to be in a rush and it's really been a delight for me actually to kind of go back old school and be able to sit down and take a good history with patients and also do a complete exam where you look at their demeanor, you look at their skin, you look at their circulation, um, you do a, a careful, more careful neurologic exam, and all of those things that we did when we were in medical school uh, before we got in a rush. Then, of course, you're going to initiate treatments and interventions. You're going to refer as needed. So um, sometimes just like you, you see that's the pattern that happened with those cases, right? And then hopefully, if you're, if you're in a position to do this, you want to maintain overall management and coordination of care. It's really important that someone on the team, the primary care doctor or whoever, a, a primary care provider of some type, really know what's going on and manage the whole for the patient. Um, these are just some basic labs that, you know, I think we all know about. If people have fatigue, you, these are, these are basically labs that um, if you don't check them, you might not know they're abnormal. So they aren't necessarily based on a symptom. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So just a CBC and a chem panel, 
I get a urinalysis because I'm looking for proteinuria and other, uh, any other or blood in their urine. These are all screens that can uh, help you come up with what might be an invisible chronic illness in the differential, like, uh, I don't know, some kind of a malignancy or an autoimmune disease. I tend to do a few more tests. Um, and then in terms of basic tests, if, if people have, have uh, unexplained chronic fatigue and pain, they really, you really need to understand why they can't function and, and make sure that their, that their heart is okay. And so these are the basic things that I think we all know how to do if we slow down. And oh, the other thing is everybody you know, needs to have their preventive screens up to date. You need to be getting your mammograms and all the things we know. So, but what do you do with people that you've done all the basics, you've done everything we've been really taught to do, and you have no clear answers or solutions for your patient? These two women that I showed you uh, basically had no one uh, managing their uh, complicated illness after people had done their tests and, and uh, nobody knew what to do with them. And so they just both got pushed in the margins. And that's, uh, that's because we're, we're maybe we need better tools. So what I want to do is uh, talk to you about tools today. And uh, that's what I want to talk about next. So there are four, I want to talk about the, these first four tools that I think are invaluable in assessing uh, patients. And we're going to talk about pain diagrams, using numeric scales, what we're called visual analog scales, uh, expanded review systems, and a tool called the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire that I think is really, really helpful for any kind of chronic pain uh, assessment. So these are pain diagrams. And the ones in the, on the left, the black ones, I, you know, I did on the computer and with paint. Right, but you can see from looking at a pain diagram that right away, someone who has widespread pain, you can, if, if you know enough about medicine, you, you can almost make a diagnosis when someone has multiple joints involved or they have a peripheral neuropathy. And one of the, one of the saddest things for me when we went to all electronic health records, it was hard to figure out how to do a pain diagram. And I really could hardly communicate to my patients without them. So the, the, the diagram on the right is a real pain, a real uh, patient. And, and you can see from looking at this pain diagram that this person has a peripheral neuropathy, um, legs and arms. Um, she also has low back pain um, and she has kind of the head, neck, shoulder tension. She gets headaches and that's her colon, that's her irritable bowel. So, you know, sometimes taking a history about fatigue or pain is very laborious. It takes a long time. And if your patient has problems with fatigue, with pain, with headaches, with sleep, um, it's, it's, uh, you can take an hour to try to go through. But if you have a tool like a pain diagram, um, you can cut that time really short and have more effective communication. So this is case number one, um, my 47-year-old female who had been labeled with depression and, um, and fibromyalgia. But if you look at her pain diagram, basically she has arthritis in her knees, her hands, and her shoulders actually. She got degenerative uh, disc disease in her shoulders and she's got spine disease. She has neck and low back pain. So yes, she has pain all over, but she doesn't really have fibromyalgia actually. Um, she has something else that we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so these are from my old clinic when we use, still use paper and we do most of it electronically now, but um, you can see that basically um, I've just outlined the major symptom categories that people with unexplained uh, fatigue and widespread pain have. It, it disrupts their, they have low energy, it affects their mood, they have cognitive complaints, they have body aches, and pain, headaches, sleep problems. And um, you can look at a glance and, and prioritize right away uh, what the worst problem is for the patient, because how do you know even where to start uh, when there are that many complaints? So every, every visit, patients come in, um, and this, this is much more like fibromyalgia. Um, and you can see in the diagram that almost everything that 
is a common pain area is, is uh, you can see the hash marks. It's not overstated. Um, this patient has something more like fibromyalgia. It's, it's actually a male patient. Um, and the only thing really bothering him that day were, were his body aches. Uh, but you can see, and headaches are really not a problem for him. So just, just looking at that is worth about 20 minutes of taking a history, and then you can fine tune it. Um, this is another patient. Um, this is a patient from a long time ago, but um, this shows how, it, how just these simple um, visual analog scales uh, ranking their fatigue, uh, based, I mean, ranking all their symptoms helps me focus right away uh, on the things that are the most debilitating and most problematic for that patient, which are the fatigue and problems with sleep. And you know, that is a concrete place to start when you're trying to uh, dig in and help someone feel better. I also, uh, you can see in her pain diagram that she really doesn't have widespread pain all over. She's having symptoms in her arms and legs but, and, and headache, but it does, it is, seems a bit overwhelming. I also want to introduce the concept of um, hours of upright activity, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. Um, and that is, uh, if you see the, those lines going across um, here, um, she, this person has only four hours in 24 when she's got her feet on the floor. And um, the rest of the time she's uh, in, a, in a recliner or in bed. That's a pretty profound piece of information that's really helpful. So the next thing that we've done in our clinic that is super helpful is instead of the normal review of systems, we have an, a much more expanded review of systems under each of the major symptoms. But even more important than that is they, they are, uh, the, the patients themselves give you information about frequency and severity of their symptoms. Um, there, was some, there was a really good study done um, in chronic fatigue syndrome a few years ago that showed that if you, if you ask about frequency and severity, you can almost always distinguish the patients from other kinds of chronic fatigue and, and all the back, background information. So I'm a visual person. People laugh at me that I've, that I've got these this way, but I kind of like to have them lined up. So you can see uh, this is our 30-year-old female. This is the younger woman in case number two. Her biggest problem is unrefreshing sleep by far. On, on, on sleep. So this breaks down sleep. And if, if, uh, if you need to have a conversation about sleep with your patient, you really want to have a good conversation. It's going to be a 20 minute conversation. But if they fill this out, you can hone right in on the most the aspects of sleep that are, that are bothering her. And then you can have a more focused discussion and decide what to do uh, to help solve her problem with sleep. So she wakes up unrefreshed. Um, sometimes she has to take naps, but she can't go to sleep. Her sleep is restless. And she gets leg cramps. So, you know, you can start to target her problem uh, with both behavioral and medication uh, interventions much more accurately by having a little bit of information. Here's another example. Same. This is our our uh, young uh, or our young woman, age 30. The case under the pain and musculoskeletal, we don't just say, do you have pain, right? We ask about tender points, burning and numbness, achy all over, tenderness, morning stiffness, joint pain, muscle pain, neck pain, low back pain, abdominal, chest, he and headaches. And you can see at a glance, just like a pain diagram, with at a moment's notice, you can look at this and you can prioritize and you can almost narrow down the diagnoses um, that would present with these kinds of symptoms. Um, but threes are very, uh, those are pretty bad scores. That's severe or constant. So she's got burning, tingling, numbness, achiness. I mean, just look. Uh, and I always feel better uh, that that isn't, it, someone's not overstating when you do this, when, when they're happy to put zeros. You know, on, on a lot of our, our uh, on our review of systems with frequency and severity, you'll have these unbelievable scores in a breakdown like this, but in other areas of the review systems, they'll all be zeros or ones. So it helps you hone right in on the problem and understand the severity and, and start going down a path uh, to have a better differential diagnosis. 
And I've seen in my experience pan positive review of systems that when broken down in this manner, you realize it's not pan positive at all. Right. Oh, and you know, uh, anybody, if anybody wants to ask a question or, um, you know, if, you know, just please uh, raise your hand or speak up or un unmute yourself and say something. Um, but yeah, and you know, it, it, it isn't that hard to create an expanded review of systems. And it isn't that hard to have people uh, give you a little better history about frequency and severity. And it takes a huge amount of time out of, out of the history and it's gonna make you a better diagnostician. We do this all electronically now. And uh, we actually have patients fill it out before they come into clinic, um, if possible. And um, these are, it's more extensive for our new patients. Um, we, we don't do the whole thing in, in, in our existing patients that are routine that we know very well. We follow the visual analog scales in every single visit. It's a good way to kind of follow how people are doing over time with, you know, symptoms like anxiety, depression, pain, fatigue that are hard to quantify otherwise. So it certainly helps you rearrange priorities from visit to visit to assess response to intervention, et cetera. Great, thanks Dr. Yeoman. Now I wanna to talk to you about one of my favorite questionnaires. This is called the FIQR, the Fibromyalgia Impact Questionnaire Revised. This is a free, rapidly available, you can just put FIQR in Google and it'll come up. Um, it's, a, it's a very short questionnaire. It takes three to five minutes uh, for the patient to do it and, and to score it or less. Um, and it, it explores the impact of pain on uh, function. There are nine questions about function, two questions about overall, and nine questions about symptom severity. And I find this to be my best really quick estimate of the severity of the way the pain, uh, chronic pain is impacting the life of my patient when they walk in. And um, this is a, the FIQR um, has been validated many, many, many times. Uh, it was developed, you don't have to have fibromyalgia to take it. There is a version called this uh, symptom, let's see, symptom, you, you just, it, it's called the SIQR or, uh, symptom impact questionnaire impact questionnaire thank you um but i just use this because um uh, it's really 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 helpful and um you can see it, you have to understand the scoring a little bit um i used to do a lot of fibromyalgia pharma trials and the average fiq score for fibromyalgia uh, in uh, patients enrolled in pharma trials it was 58 so that just shows a little bit of the skew about who ends up going for pharmaceutical trials. And it's because they can't you know, enroll people who are complicated or who are severely ill or who have a lot of other comorbid conditions. So if, if you think about those average scores and um, anybody watching, you just put, go to the website, you can download the FIQ. It's a really quick 20 uh, question questionnaire. So let's go back to our cases. Um, the middle-aged woman, case number one, her FIQ score was 68. So she's pretty much in the severe range of pain, but I showed you from the pain diagram that her pain was really uh, from arthritis and spine pain, uh, as opposed to uh, fibromyalgia. Um, case number two, my 30-year-old, um, that's a that's a pretty dang high FIQ score. <laughs> we don't, we hardly ever see uh, in the 80s, but you know that ranks uh, based on very, very good validated data of the FIQ that um, she is in extreme pain, extreme, extreme pain from a widespread pain process. All right, I'm going to move on to a few other things we do. So I basically talked about ways to assess severity, frequency and severity with those tools. But these are tools we use to try to un understand better how the illness is impacting people's uh, function. And um, I, I wanna, they, they may be a little strange, but I wanna uh, I tell you about them because they've proven to be really, really, really useful in our clinic. Uh, and not only for understanding their illness better and being able to understand uh, the causes, but uh, to be able to treat them and help them uh, have improved quality of life and function. 
So the first one um, is something I, I started using in clinic after I heard uh, a lecture on, uh, from another venerable old doctor uh, in the field of chronic fatigue, uh, and he called it hours of upright activity. And so I referred to it up there. So hours of upright activity, this is a report the patient gives. Um, they, they, they just tell you how many hours in 24 um, do they spend with their feet on the floor. So that you have to make sure that they understand that sitting with your feet on the floor counts as upright activity. Um, otherwise, it's, it's easy to make a mistake with this. Um, and it, it, you kind of have to train people. But if you think about hours of upright activity, um, and it's this little graph up in the left-hand corner, you can see that at the blue is healthy people generally have about 14 to 17 hours of the day that they've got their feet on the floor. Sit, sitting, walking, standing, uh, it, we don't even think about it. Um, and what I noticed from asking about hours of upright activity in our clinic is that most people with chronic illness, like fibromyalgia, have about 10 to 12 hours of upright activity with their feet on the floor because they need to sit down and rest more. Um, and they're just uh, less physically active. Um, but people with, in our clinic uh, who, who qualify for a diagnosis called ME-CFS, which we'll be talking about uh, a little bit more on day three, um, it reports sometimes zero to seven hours of upright activity. That means feet on the floor. And um, we'll talk to you about why that is, but uh, hours of upright activity is zero to seven. Something is really wrong with that person. You need to exclude um, depression because you know depression can put people in bed and, and put the covers over their head. But we screen for depression. And, and there's also a test we use called the the MFI that we're not going to talk about today, but it 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 uh, divides fatigue into four different categories, and one of them is about motivation. And motivation, what's the difference between people who are depressed and people who have a chronic illness is that people who are depressed can't think of anything to do and they're unmotivated. And people with a chronic illness that limits their activity are trapped in a body that doesn't work, and they would love to do things if they could get up and do them. Um, so by a combination of screening. Uh, doing mental health screening and asking about hours of upright activity, you can very clearly identify people who have very low tolerance uh, for activity and very low functional capacity. And if you don't know that, um, if you don't ask this, I mean, it, it shocked me. It started when I started asking this, this question of patients. It helps you understand how profoundly ill they are. Um, next is what I've learned to do that really helps in communication, makes it more crystal clear how the illness is affecting a patient, is to ask, be sure you get a range of symptom severity and real examples of function. So we ask about a good day, good days and bad days, and try to get them to estimate how many good days and bad days are each month, and specific examples, and let me show you uh, and this. So this is our 30 year old case. Um, she says, we'll do her bad day next, but on good days, she said she has five to 10 good days a month. And during those days, she has one to two hours of upright activity. And when you ask her for specific examples of what, you, of what she can do and what she cannot do, even on a good day. So on her best days, she can drive, go on a walk, run an errand with help. And, but she, even on her best days, she cannot clean her house, make her own meals or go to work. So in a very short time with specific examples, you can just envision the function of this patient and how their life has been uh, impaired. And if you look at her bad days, uh, majority of the month, she calls her, her bad days. And on those days, she doesn't spend more than 30 minutes total in 24 with her feet on the ground. So she spends almost the entire day reclining her in bed. Just gets up, go to the bathroom, walk, you know, walk through the house. And on bad days, she can still sit up, read, watch TV, eat. And on, on these bad days, she um, eat, on bad days, she cannot walk or 
have conversations. So she's profoundly ill. She's 30 years old and nobody's been able to help her. The next test I want to talk about, um, I don't think is really used very much in medicine. It's used in research. Um, it's called the SF, the SF 36 and it's, it's called, it stands for short form and there's 36 questions. And this research tool, the SF 36, um, has been used and validated across almost every chronic illness to assess um, the range of uh, symptoms that go from uh, physical to mental. And let me just show you by, uh, can, can you see my mouse when I put it on there? Okay, so these are the domains of the SF36. There are 36 questions divided between uh, these domains, physical function, how, uh, how, it, how physical uh, function affects your role, your ability to, to do your role, bodily pain, general health, vitality, social function, how it affects your, how emotion affects your role and your mental health. And if you think about this as a spectrum of eight domains, the, on, the, on the left are the physical function, on the right is mental health. And as it gets closer to the middle, there, there's kind of a, a blur between whether it's a mental health or a physical problem. So if you look on the right side, this is a graph from a paper in 2002 that was a paper about congestive heart failure. And the line up on top, these are the scores, average scores for the general population. So physical fatigue, physical function, sorry, role physical, bodily pain, general health, vitality, social function, role emotional, and mental health. So can't you just see that? That's our population, that's our general healthy population is we're all um, tired and stressed, right? So the lowest scores, and remember that the best scores on this one are high, um, the lowest scores are in uh, vitality, general health and vitality. I think we're just kind of all run down and stressed out and that's reflected right here uh, in the mental health. If you look at these chronic diseases, you can see this one's depression. So it's characterized by, uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. So here's depression, um, so more fatigue than the general population, and certainly their roles are altered. Anyway, you can go and see. And this was to show uh, that how much impact uh, uh, congestive heart failure had. So um, I want to show you the uh, SF36 scores for our two cases. And keep in mind that it, it goes uh, on the left-hand side, uh, or yeah, that it goes on a range uh, from physical function, the physical components to the mental components. And before I go, I just wanna say that this is a research tool. So when people design a protocol, they pay to have uh, the SF36 done and scored and it's, you know, it's proprietary, but it's such a good scale that they created an alternate scale called the RAN36 that is free and open to any clinicians to use uh, in clinical practice if they want to um, assess their patients. And I actually found a, a site right here. It's a little bit difficult to score, but all you have to do is go to this site and your patient can fill it in uh, and it automatically scores and, and gives you a score. So let's look at, so we, we, we use the RAN36 in every new patient that we see to get an idea of the range of, uh, of their scores across physical function and mental health. So this is my middle-aged patient, 47. Her, and uh, her physical function is 10% of normal and role physical, zero, bodily pain, general health. Her vitality's zip. But look at her preserved scores in social functioning, role, emotional, and mental health. She was being managed by a psychiatrist, but her main problem are the zeros and the 10. Can you see that? I mean, it's so clear, so easy to understand once you, once you become familiar with this. So 
her emotions, um, her emotional health is not altering her ability to have her, uh, to carry out her life. She's not limited at all by her emotions right now. This is at the moment that we did it. So this is a, this is a really good example of how um, a, a 36 uh, question questionnaire that is highly validated and that has been used across almost all chronic illness research uh, can be a valuable tool in the clinic just to understand uh, how the presenting multi-system illness is impacting your patient. Here is, here are the RAND 36 scores of our 30-year-old woman, our young, younger woman. And um, you can, oh, by the way, I'll come back to there. The, the next most preserved scores in our, in our 47-year-old were her pain scores, <laughs> right? I mean, she was primarily giving, given two diagnoses at, after her presentation. One was uh, depression and one was um, fibromyalgia. And those are, her, uh, those are her more relatively preserved scores. Okay, so here's our female age 30. Um, physical function, look at there, she's just zero everywhere. <laughs> and very low scores because she got a terrible chronic illness that no one can fix. And then she became desperate, anxious, depressed, and suicidal because her life was devastated by this chronic illness. And so you could see we had some work to do. Any questions about the, the RAN 36 from anybody? Okay, the next test we do in our clinic that has been amazingly helpful to create um, uh, more depth in our understanding of these multi-system illnesses. Um, it's simply orthostatic testing, but it's more standardized so that you're more able to see uh, what it is we're looking for. And this is called the 10-minute NASA lean tests, basically because some of the very early research about orthostatic intolerance was done uh, in astronauts uh, at, at NASA. And um, so they pioneered and tested out just doing these bedside orthostatic tests before they moved to more um, sophisticated tilt table tests. So um, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, it just takes a blood pressure cuff, an oximeter, a stethoscope, and it usually is helpful to have two people. Um, it, you start the test by having someone lie down for 10 minutes, quiet, supine, rest and maybe in a dark room meditating and measure what their supine heart rate and blood pressure are. Then you have the subject slowly move and stand and lean against the wall uh, with an oximeter and a blood pressure cuff. And you measure their heart rate and blood pressure every one or two minutes for 10 minutes. So let me show you the lean test in um, our 47 year old woman. You can see that when she's lying down, she's got a very normal, uh, blood pressure for someone her age, and a nice slow heart rate. The minute we stood her up, her blood pressure continually went down. And actually, she really didn't get as much of a heart rate response as I would like to see in someone who's about to pass out. Um, and, you know, we recreated many of her symptoms, in, including the fact that she became cognitively impaired and couldn't continue talking to us at about seven minutes, and we had to gradually let her down to the ground. So um, the, diagno the diagnosis of systolic orthostatic hypotension requires at least a 20-point drop in the, in the systolic pressure, and you can see that that happened uh, during her test. So we at least had uh, one really important target uh, for treatment and also to try to understand in the differential diagnosis why she has this, um, this problem and that's making it so difficult for her to function. Now, let me show you the 10 minute Nasaline test in our 30 our year old. So she lying down, nice 30 year old blood pressure, 102 for 76, uh, heart rate of 75. And as soon as we stood her up, the main thing that happened is our heart rate went up and up and up and up until it was up 43 beats per minute in a quiet stand, um, meeting the criteria for, for POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. But another thing I want to point out is 
you can also look at the pulse pressure. So the pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure. And where's my mouse? There it is. So the 26 is a little bit low. If you think about a pulse pressure, if the normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, uh, in, a, in an adult, it's usually about 40. Um, hers was a little low to begin with. And you can see it just sort of tanked out. Um, and a normal uh, pulse pressure, you know, everybody's pulse pressure narrows when you stand up. That's the compensatory response. But it shouldn't uh, go below 25% of uh, the systolic blood pressure. And hers went down to 14%. So basically, she's not pumping anything. Uh, and she's in the equivalent of a circulatory failure when she stands up. I think it's important to point out here that it's really uh, the narrowing is more a function of change in the diastolic pressures than it is in the systolic. It's not cardiogenic heart failure. It's uh, that the blood pressures are dropping and the diastolics are rising to try to compensate for this positional change that we're testing. It's basically like hypovolemic. Uh, it's it's a it's it, it's um, equivalent to what would happen if someone was very hypo, hypovolemic. Okay. So we've been doing this bedside testing in almost everybody who comes to our clinic with unexplained uh, and abnormal function, and uh, we've learned a lot. Um, it's a big category, and we'll talk about it more in some of in the future uh, lectures this week. So um, the other thing I've started to use that is very helpful, uh, and we're trying to understand how it cor how it correlates with the findings on actually physically doing orthostatic testing. Um, and that is, uh, I found these, uh, this questionnaire called the orthostatic hypotension questionnaire. Um, Ten, per, 10 points per do, do, donate, per, sorry, per domain if the symptoms were the worst. Now, this is the flip side. So a uh, low score is normal and the high score is the most abnormal. And, um, and you could divide it into, into symptoms and uh, activity. And in, in our healthy controls, in some of the studies we've done, it's rare for any healthy control to have a score higher than 10 out of 100. And let me show you uh, basically our, our, our female age 30, her combined scores on the orthostatic intolerance questionnaire were 76 out of 100. And you can use this, this questionnaire uh, probably in place of, or to, to screen and decide if you need to do orthostatic testing, because if anybody scores more than about 10, um, they probably ought to have orthostatic testing. And I just put uh, next to that, her seated vital signs, if you would look at her vital signs when she walks in, you can see, I, you know, she probably has POTS, <laughs> but, um, and you remember it, her, she was 60 beats a minute uh, lying down before she did the lean test. Um, and then when we did the lean test, uh, sorry, when we did the lean test, uh, you can see how everything changed. So this is a really uh, good, uh, screen, um, pretty simple, um, uh, just those, those domains to try to understand how, how if orthostatic intolerance is present and, and if it's, how it's affecting symptoms and function. So just a quick review. I think it's hard to just talk about dry uh, tools, but um, these are tools that have made a huge difference in our ability to assess patients with unexplained chronic fatigue and widespread pain and to really give us more granularity about how to dig deeper into what the causes might be. Um, it's always uh, helpful as part of the differential diagnosis. And we talked, just to review, we talked about using pain diagrams, um, visual analog scales for the major symptom clusters, uh, that when you have, that to have a more expanded review systems for these big symptom categories like fatigue and sleep and pain and cognition, 
and always ask about frequency and severity. We did it on a four point uh, scale, zero, uh, zero to three. Um, the FIQR is a free and easily a quick and easy tool to understand how uh, the impact of chronic pain on function. Um, if you ask about hours of upright activity, you're going to start to be shocked. <laughs> yes, because once you once you you see the spread, you, you will be able to nail down very easily. And I think a lot of those patients have orthostatic intolerance syndromes. Um, we ask about good day, bad day, and uh, what you can do and can't do on those days. Um, that RAN, the RAN 36 is a great tool, and then orthostatic testing has been an, another golden tool. I was just going to comment that I think it's important on good day, bad day. Uh, some people will say all days are bad days, um, and we're trying to remind them that no days are, are great. We understand that you're ill, but what is the variance you know, from day to day? What days are much worse and what days are much better? You get a much better response and more helpful information in that regard. And then the other thing I wanted to bring attention to, and I was hoping, Dr. Bateman, you might comment on this more, is with the Nasoline test, the importance of doing the full 10 minutes, even though that may seem like a pain. Yep, um, there are uh, quite a few studies um, now. Where I think we have a paper that is uh, on its way to publication, at least it's been submitted, that, um, that shows um, the, uh, that you have to do at least five minutes to elicit, elicit findings. And that um, if, you, if, you, if you really need, you learn the most by doing the full 10 minutes. And there are also some studies using in, in tilt table testing uh, that an abbreviated tilt table test will miss many things. What you, what you might miss in just 10 minutes is uh, what's called neurally mediated hypotension, which is a delayed faint uh, that sometimes takes a longer test. But we're just trying to come up with tools that very quickly and easily will help us understand uh, what might be going on with the patient. And it's been really, really interesting. So, um, I'm sure we can take a couple of questions if people have it. Um, but tomorrow, we're going to, uh, Dr. Yellman's going to talk about um, a number of conditions you might not think about or be aware of um, that can cause debilitation and that kind of pan positive review systems. Um, and, and when otherwise, the routine standard labs and tests would all be, be normal. We'll look forward to hearing more from, from Dr. Yellman tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Wednesday. Thank you, everybody.